I want to share with you today about the faith of God, having the faith of God. This is one of the most important things that can be shared and can be ministered with any person. It's a basic fundamental of the Word of God. And as you understand this, as we get into it, you're going to find that this will completely change your thinking about yourself and about God. And then as you understand and operate in it, it'll change your circumstance. You'll begin to experience a life of victory and of power. Now, why is it important to have the faith of God? Well, for one thing, you need to recognize that there is a human faith, that there is a spiritual faith. A human faith, or what I'm going to call a sense knowledge faith, a faith that operates according to the five senses, it will only bring for you, it will only produce for you the ability of man. It won't produce miracles for you. To operate in miracles, you have to have a supernatural faith, a spiritual faith, or God's kind of faith. And this is important. God has made his faith available unto us. I want to say that again. God has made his faith available unto us. Now, people tell me all the time, they say, oh, I know that God can do things. We just need faith. We just need so much more faith. And people are all the time running down and, and disregarding the power and the faith that God has given them. What you need to understand is that for you, if you are a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not operating under your own power, under your own faith, but God has committed his faith to you. He has given it to you so that you can use it and see the same results that God sees. Praise God. We have available to us the same power that God is using, and that is faith. By faith, he created the heavens and the earth. By faith, he maintains them. By faith, he has reserved them unto the day of judgment. By faith, he does everything. God is a faith being, and he has made available to us his very nature, his faith. And praise God, you've got to begin to see this and to understand it. Now, I want to share this from the Word of God. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, Verse 8 and verse 9, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. He says that you are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. When he says, and that not of yourselves, he's speaking of that faith is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So let me read it again like that. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that faith is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God gave you his faith to believe for salvation. Without God's faith, you cannot be saved. Man's faith cannot operate in anything except sense knowledge. It can only operate according to the five senses, according to what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. Like, for instance, some of you have probably heard examples about people saying that it's faith to sit down in a chair that you've never sat in before. You're exercising faith that that chair is going to hold you up. You're exercising a physical sense knowledge faith that that chair is going to hold you up because you know that there are certain standards put forth on chairs. They're, they're made to hold you up. You've seen it. It's been told you before. You've sat down in chairs before. You've experienced them working and performing what they're made for. And also, if you're going into the home of somebody, wherever it is that you're sitting down, you also have a confidence in that person, a person that you can see that they would not let you sit down in a bum chair. And so you see, you're operating according to sense knowledge. You've had experience. You can see the chair. It looks good. It looks all of these things. You're operating according to what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. That is a sense knowledge type faith. And you will never, never, never be able to operate with that type of sense knowledge faith for something that you cannot see. Like say, for instance, you were to go in and somebody tells you, well, now there's a chair there. You can't see it, but sit down. Well, see, you couldn't operate in a sense knowledge type faith and do that because you just wouldn't sit down. You wouldn't. Uh, if you're operating in a sense knowledge, a human type faith, you will not try and sit down where you can't see a chair. That's stupid. And you wouldn't do it. But you see, in God's Word, you have to believe the things that you cannot see. And so God gave us a supernatural faith, a faith that is not limited by the five senses, but a faith that calls those things which be not as though they were. 
That's Romans chapter 4, verse 17. It tells you about God, and it tells you what kind of faith he operates in, and it says that he quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Now, that's God's kind of faith. That's the way that it operates. It can call those things which be not, things that are not, things that have no substance, no evidence, no proof of it. God can call them as if they were. In other words, he deals with things that you can't see as already being done. Now, that's the way that God's faith operates. It is not limited by the five senses. It can believe for things that you cannot see. So we have to have God's type of faith to believe for salvation. Because when you believe for salvation, you're believing that you're translated out of the kingdom of the devil and put into the kingdom of God. You can't see that. You've got to believe it with a supernatural faith that is not based on five senses. You're also believing that your sins are forgiven. You can't see sins, and you can't see them forgiven. You can't see the scars they leave on lives. You can't see when God wipes them away and makes you whiter than snow. You have to believe for that with a supernatural faith, a faith that is not based on the five senses. You, when you come to the Lord for salvation, are believing for miracles that cannot be perceived with your physical eye and with your senses. So you see that it has to be the faith of God that you use to get saved. This is exactly what this is saying in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. That faith is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest every man should boast. So you see, God has made his faith available to you. You have to use it for salvation. Now, if you use it for salvation, according to these scriptures over here in Galatians, he said, are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect in the flesh? If you have to have a gift of faith, if you have to have the faith of God to believe for salvation, how could we be so foolish to begin in the Spirit and then think that after we get saved, we can be perfected by our own physical type faith? No, it won't work. You have to continue to operate in the faith of God. You have to get out of operating in a physical type faith, a faith that is based on the five senses, and you have to learn to operate in the faith of God, in the faith of God, a faith that calls those things which be not as though they were. Now, we're establishing that God has already given you his faith. It is available to you. I want to reemphasize this. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3, Paul is speaking. And he is telling the people there in chapter 12, verse 3, I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Paul tells us to think soberly according as God hath dealt. God's the one that gives out this faith. It is not a human natural sense knowledge faith it is the gift of god this is the same thing that's being ministered in ephesians 2 8 and 9 god has dealt to every man the measure of faith it is a god-given faith it is not a human faith it is not natural it is not what the world operates in it is not what most people have called faith it is a god-given faith a supernatural faith and when you operate in god's faith you will begin to see the same things operate for you that operate for god now, if you are not having that type of victory, if you are not seeing the miracle things happen that happened with God, then there is something wrong with your faith. If your faith was operative, then it would be producing for you the same as it does the Lord Jesus. It says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, it says that this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. If you have God's kind of faith, it is a world-overcoming type of faith. It will overcome problems. It will overcome strife. It will overcome sickness, disease, poverty. It will overcome loneliness. It will give you victory in every circumstance, in every situation. Now, that's God's kind of faith. And an easy way to check out whether or not you're operating in God's kind of faith is just simply are you having the same victory that God is having, the same victory that was manifest in the Word of God among the Lord Jesus Christ and the early New Testament believers. And if that faith is not operating within you, if you're not having that type of victory, then the faith of God just simply is not functioning. It doesn't mean you don't have it if you're a born-again believer, but it means that you aren't operating in it. One of the biggest weapons that Satan has against the gospel is ignorance. And we have been taught that it is humility to go around and say, oh, I know that I'm just of little faith. 
and oh me, and oh my, and I know that I can't believe God for anything great. Well, you see, that's not according to the Word of God. God says that if you believe on Him, the works that He did shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do. He says nothing is impossible to him that believes. And then from these scriptures, we're showing you that He says that He has given to every man the measure of faith. So you see, it's not humility, it's stupidity to go around and confess something contrary to the Word of God. God says that you have faith. God says that you have His faith, that without His faith you can't get saved. So you need to believe it. First of all, know it, believe it, and then learn how to operate in it. This scripture right here in Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says, God has dealt to every, every man. That means there is not a person listening to me right now that has not had a God-given faith given to him. Now, of course, it'll profit you nothing if you're not a born-again believer. First of all, you have to receive that faith through salvation, through confessing that Jesus Christ is your Lord and with your mouth and believing in your heart God's raised him from the dead. Submit your life, commit your life to Jesus, and then that faith becomes yours. For those of you that have already done that, then you have received the measure of faith. It doesn't say a measure. There is not a measure given to me and a measure given to you. There are not some people that have an abundance of faith that have just faith flowing out of them, just overflowing, and some that just have a little dip, a dribble of faith. Every person, every born-again believer has been dealt the measure of faith, one measure of faith. Now, what this means is that we have the same faith available to us today that was available to the Apostle Paul, to Peter, to Stephen, to Philip, to all of these people. Now, this is verified in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. And Peter was writing, and he said, Peter, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained, past tense, have obtained like precious faith with us. We have obtained like precious faith, the same precious faith that Peter had. Now, you've got that same faith within you. God has only dealt one measure of faith to every person. Now, as we continue to get into this, we're going to talk about a great faith and about a small faith. I'm not, that does not mean that one person has more faith than the other. It means that one person has more faith operative than the other. When the Lord spoke of a person having great faith and having small faith, he was talking about those who were releasing great faith or releasing a small faith. But according to these scriptures, I want you to see that God has only given out one measure of faith. When you get saved, God gives you his faith, and he only gives one measure. He gives the same amount that was given to Peter, that was given to Paul. And if you want to get technical, you have the exact same amount of faith within you that indwelt the Lord Jesus Christ. I say that because the Bible makes it clear, specifically, I'll take this one reference from Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. This is a uh, familiar passage of Scripture to many people. And Paul is writing, and he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul a person who experienced tremendous victory, tremendous victory, who is an example, who lived such a powerful life. God used him to write nearly two-thirds of the New Testament to transform entire continents. In one place he walked in and the people said, Behold, he that's t turned the world upside down has come here also. Everywhere he went, Paul said God made manifest the savor of his presence in every place by them. He said, Thanks be unto God who always causeth us to triumph through our Lord Jesus Christ. The man who had all of those things going for him said that the way it worked was the fact that the life which he now lived in the flesh, he lived by the faith of the Son of God. He lived by the faith of the Son of God. Paul was using God's faith. He was aware that God had dealt his very faith unto Paul. How did Paul get it? on the road to Damascus, and then in Damascus when Ananias came and prayed for him, and he received the Lord Jesus Christ, he received faith. He was saved by grace, through faith, and that faith was not of itself. It was a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God gave Paul his faith. 
to believe for salvation and remained within him. The faith of the Lord Jesus Christ came within him. The same measure of faith that the Lord Jesus Christ had within him, it was invested within Paul. And God has also invested that same measure of faith within every last person listening to me right now. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, you have the same faith that Jesus had. Praise God. Now, if all this be so, many of you think, well, if that's so, if I've got the same faith, why doesn't it produce? Faith has to be acted on. Faith has to be released. Now, this is what it's ministering over in James, the second chapter. He makes it clear that faith without works is dead. You can have the faith of God within you. You can have the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, living within you in all of its power. And yet, if you do not ha know how to act on it, the Bible says in James chapter 2 that faith without works, faith without action, action is dead. And you see, this is exactly what's happened. Satan has come in and deceived us. Satan has come in and taught many times through church that, well, you can't receive miracles from God. There's many people that believe that miracles have passed away, that God doesn't do them anymore. Well, you see, the faith of God that's within them is not going to profit them anything because they'll never act on that faith. They'll never act and believe for miracles and act like they've got a miracle because they don't believe that it's happening anymore. You see, that's a deception of the devil. And also Satan has come and told us that we're unworthy, that we just can't receive from God. That will kill the faith of God within you. If you're unworthy, then you aren't going to go out and begin to use what God has given you. If I was to give you a million dollars, but you said, oh, I'm so unworthy, Andy shouldn't have given that to me, I don't deserve it, I just can't use that, well, it'll never profit you a thing. But if I was to give you a million dollars, even though you didn't deserve it, if you believed it, and if you rejoiced in it, you could go out and you could go on a spending spree. You could do whatever you want to. But first of all, you'd have to be confident that it's yours, that it's yours to use, and you'd have to be getting bold with it. You couldn't go out there and just say, well, I'll write a $5 check. Maybe that won't hurt too much. You see, $5 a lick, you wouldn't be able to spend much of that million dollars. You're going to have to be bold and believe that you've got it and go forth and use it. And Satan is coming to the body of Christ and deceived us and told us that we can't that we cannot use the faith of God, that we can't do these things. Oh, we're just weak and unprofitable. Well, you were, but when you got saved, Jesus changed you. You are a new creature, and within you is the very faith of God. Now, in your flesh, in your physical body, it's not changed yet. There's nothing for you to brag about through your own wisdom, through your own goodness, but with the saved person within you, yes, there's something to be proud of. There's something to brag about. There's something to be bold about. And if you don't have that type of attitude, the very faith of God will be hindered within you. You've got to believe, first of all, that you have the faith of God. That is the first step. You do have the faith of God. Now that you believe that you've got the faith of God, you've got to know how to operate in it. Faith without works is dead, so you have to learn how to release that faith. To do this, I want to share, you, share with you about a physical faith and about a spiritual faith or God's kind of faith and show you the difference, show you why one faith Jesus said was a small faith, why the other faith Jesus marveled at their great faith and was amazed to see the, the faith that they had released. Now, I want to show this to you. First of all, from John chapter 20, this is the example where after Jesus had resurrected from the dead, he appeared back unto the disciples, and he stood in the midst as they were in the upper room, and he said, Peace be unto them, and they were amazed. And then they believed when they saw the Lord Jesus. In verse 24 of John chapter 20, it says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Now this is an example of a physical, human-type faith. 
a faith that is based on the five senses. Thomas said out of his own mouth, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, that's the way many, many of you, me, and all of us have been taught. That's really the way that everybody has been taught to operate. We say that unless I can see it with my eyes, touch it with my hands, taste it, feel it, some way or another, unless my five senses can grab hold of it, I do not believe it. Many of you, have been, you know, you've said many, many a times, I just cannot believe that. Why can't you believe it? Because you've never experienced it, you can't touch it, you can't feel it. Well, you see, this is the type of faith that Thomas was operating in. And Jesus appeared to him and told him. He said, put your finger into my hands and put your hand into my side. And Thomas then believed. And Jesus turned around and said, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, because of your five senses, because of a sense knowledge faith, you have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. The Lord put the greater blessing upon the person who has not seen and yet has believed. He put a greater blessing upon the person who does not operate in a sense knowledge faith, but operates in a faith that is based not on sense knowledge, but on the Word of God. Now, this is out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And I want you to see this is exactly the reason many of us have not received our miracles from the Lord because we pray, we desire, we want the right things, but we're operating in a physical sense knowledge type faith. We're saying, Lord, do this for me. And then you look to see if it's done. Let me get specific. If you pray for healing and you say, Lord, heal my body. Lord, heal me. I believe that you heal me. And then you get through praying and you look at the part of your body that was bad. Or you feel of the part of your body that was bad to see if you're healed. Well, that's a sense knowledge faith. You see, you aren't going to believe that God answered that prayer until you can feel it in your body, until you can see it with your eyes, until you can touch it with one of your five senses. And that is a sense knowledge type faith, and that's exactly the reason that you have not received healing many a time. You pray for your home. You pray for your husband to be saved, your wife to be saved, your children to be touched. You pray a prayer, you believe, and then you get up and you look. And you say, well, boy, I don't see any change. It doesn't look like they've responded any at all. And you wipe your prayer out through unbelief, through sense knowledge, through a physical type faith, rather than operating in the faith of God. What you need to do is take the Word of God and let that be your evidence. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You see, God's kind of faith, when you operate in it, you can pray a prayer and you can take God's word and let that be your evidence that your answer has come to pass. And because of it, that kind of faith will call those things which be not as though they were. Remember, we use that scripture already. Romans chapter 4, verse 17. God's kind of faith calls those things which be not as though they were. What that actually is saying is that God's kind of faith creates it. If there is no precedent for what you're believing for, if there is no physical evidence of it, you can believe and it'll be created if it has to. God's faith is a creating faith. He spoke the worlds into existence. And if you'll look over in Genesis, the first chapter, he said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. He didn't see the light until after he had already spoken out of his mouth, let there be light. If you'll study this over in Genesis chapter 1, God said, let there be light. He said that right at the beginning of creation. I think it was the very first day of creation. It says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and he divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and he called the darkness night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. God created that on the first day. He said, let there be light and light shone forth. And then in the 14th verse of the first chapter of Genesis, it says that God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so. And God made two lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Can you see here that God on the very first day spoke and said, let there be light. And there was light. It happened. And yet it was the fourth day and before there was any source of light created before there was ever a sun, a moon, or any stars. 
Can you see that God's faith spoke light into existence when there was no source for that light, according to what we know? There was no sun, there was no moon, there were no stars, and yet God said, let there be light, and it came to pass. He created it with his faith. He did not have to have something to work from, an experience to go from, a physical thing that he could see. He can speak out of his mouth and it will come to pass. God has given us this same kind of faith, the same kind of faith that we can actually speak, and if you will not base it on your five senses, if you will not limit God through operating in a physical faith, if you'll take his faith and use it, then you can flat create what you need through faith. You can, If you pray for healing and your body doesn't feel healed, you cannot go by that. You can base it on the Word of God and say that I am healed because God's Word promises me that I am, and you can stand on it, and you can literally make that healing manifest in your body. Even though your body may not feel like it, it has to come to pass. You can pray for your home. You can pray for circumstances. And if you don't waver, if you don't begin to look and say, well, I can't see it, it doesn't look like it. If you continue to operate in God's kind of faith that calls those things which be not as though they were, you can command the, the situation to change. It will transform. I operated in this one time. In my, when the Lord first called me to minister, concerning finances. And I believed God for finances, and, and it's a long story. I won't go into it, but we were in a hole. We were about to get kicked out of a place where we lived because we didn't have finances. I knew it was wrong, and I'd done everything. I hadn't wavered, but I just flat didn't have the money, and we were in a bind. And so we held fast to our confession. When I went to bed that night, they, we had an eviction notice that they was going to kick us out the next morning or come seize anything that was in our apartment to pay. And when I went to bed that night, we weren't discouraged, we weren't despaired, and I just kept believing God. I didn't know much about it then, it's the reason we were late. But I was fighting. I was trying to believe God. When we went to bed that night, I said, Lord, it says in your word concerning the works of your hand, command, me, command ye me. And I said that you have power to create it. And I laid hands on a chair that was at our desk. And I said, Lord, you said you'd supply my needs, and if you have to, I command you to turn that money into, I command that chair to be turned into money, but I command my needs to be met because I know that that is the will of God. And we went to bed, and I didn't worry about it. And at 1.30 that morning, God didn't turn the chair into money. That's not his perfect plan. That's not his best will. But what I'm saying is when I got my attitude of my heart that way, when I got that determined, when I refused to go by what I could see, then God supplied we had not told one person that we needed money. It was a miracle. And we had a man drive over 100 miles, wake us up at 1.30 in the morning, a person that didn't agree with us, that disagreed, that thought I was foolish for doing the things I was doing. Yet God touched his heart. He drove over 100 miles and gave his last $150 to me, turned around and drove back. And you can say what you want to, but that's a pretty powerful miracle. And it came to pass because we operated in God's kind of faith that didn't look at the circumstances. We didn't look at the late notices. We didn't look at the threats. We didn't look at the way that it looked like we had failed. We kept looking at the Word of God. God's Word said He would supply all of our need through Christ Jesus. God's Word says nothing is impossible to him that believes. God's Word says that our, this is a victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. We kept looking at it, we kept believing it, and because of it, God, in effect, just created our miracle. He created the supply that we needed from a very, very unexpected source. And that's what we have available unto us. We have that kind of faith available. I want to show you now over in Matthew chapter 8 a faith that was based on the Word of God, a faith that the Lord Jesus Christ marveled at. And it says right here in the 8th chapter of Matthew chapter 8 verse 5, it says, When Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant, lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, 
Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Here is a faith that made the Lord Jesus Christ marvel that he had never seen so great a faith in another person. Well, now, what was the difference between this type of faith and between and, and Thomas's type of faith that he operated in? Thomas said, unless I can see, unless I can understand with my five senses, I will not believe. This man said, Lord, I don't have to see you go there. I don't have to see you touch him. I don't have to see your presence. I don't have to do anything. I put the uh, importance on your word. In effect, he was saying, I recognize the authority, the power that is in the word of God. If you'll speak your word only, you don't have to go touch him. You don't have to be there. You don't have to do anything. Your word is it. Your word is sole authority. When God's word is spoken, it is done. And Jesus looked at that man and said, I've not found so great a faith. No, not in Israel. A faith that was based on the Word of God, not on what they could see, not on what they could understand, not on feeling, touch, smell, taste, or any of these things, but based solely on the Word of God. God said that that was the greatest form of faith, the greatest faith that he had ever seen. Now, you remember what we've ministered. God has made available to you his faith. You need to learn how to act on it to get God's faith working. God's faith is this greatest type of faith that Jesus is talking about right here. So to get God's faith operative, you have to start taking the Word of God by itself as sole authority and not interpreting, not trying to understand necessarily with your physical senses, but let God's Word rule. If God says you're healed, you believe it, you begin to speak it, you begin to do it, not because you look healed, not because you feel healed, but because God's Word says it. And as you begin to operate in this, as you grow in it, and as you finally begin to perfect it and live it in your life, you'll find that every time the healing will come instantly. It will be manifest that you will not have to fight over a prolonged period of time. But when you're first starting, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 that when you were first enlightened, you endure a great fight of afflictions. Many people try this, and they hear people say, well, you're supposed to say that you're healed even if it doesn't look like you're healed. And they try it, and they say, well, I'm healed. But the, all the time, you see, they aren't believing from their heart that they're healed. They aren't putting God's Word first place. They're just trying. And they're, they've got their attention focused on their body the whole time, wondering, is it going to come to pass? Is it going to work? Well, you see, that's still a sense, knowledge, faith. Even though you may be saying the right thing with your mouth, it's still a sense, knowledge, faith. You haven't believed it from your heart. You can't try this thing because I guarantee you, when you're enlightened, when now this truth is coming unto you, you're going to endure a great fight of afflictions. The first time you try and operate in it, it may not work instantly. It may, it may not, but Satan is going to fight you. Satan's going to throw everything that he's got at you. But I promise you that if you endure... If you stand steadfast, and if you don't waver, if you continue on, then Satan is going to run his course. He's going to throw everything he's got at you. You're going to win, and from that time on, you'll begin to see the miracle power of God manifest. You'll see God's healing manifest instantly. You'll see answers to your prayers come when you begin to operate in God's kind of faith, a faith that is based on the Word of God. Now, I want to explain this just a little bit further. I want you to look over in John chapter 14. Jesus was speaking to his disciples here. This was some of his last-minute instructions to them right before he went back to be with God the Father, right before the crucifixion. And the first part of the chapter is familiar. Jesus was telling them not to let their heart be troubled, that they believed in God, believe in him also, that God had prepared a place for them. And he says in verse 4, he says, Whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Now, Jesus had just spoken and said, Whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas turned around and said unto him, This is the same Thomas that we were talking about over in John chapter 20, the one that says, Unless I can see, unless I can feel, I won't believe. And this Thomas turned around and see, he couldn't see the place that Jesus was going to. He couldn't feel it. He had never been there, and so he couldn't understand what Jesus was talking about. Jesus had just said, Whether I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas turns around and said, Lord, that's not right. That's not right. We don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? 
In effect, he was saying, no, God, you're wrong. That is a lie. We do not know where you're going. Now, that sounds stupid, doesn't it? Jesus had just said, I, I, whether I go, you know, and the way you know. And Th Thomas turned around and says, no, that's not right. Well, I want you to see that's no different than what you and I have been doing. God says in his word, by his stripes we were healed. Past tense, 1 Peter 2, 24. By his stripes we were healed, that it's already done. It's a part of the atonement, that your healing is already there. Now, that's what God says, and yet many of you, right now listening to me, may have a sickness in your body. You may have prayed for it. You get up from your knees or however it is you prayed. After you prayed and you look right at your body and you say, nope, I'm not healed. I don't know what happened. Well, God says you are healed. You say, no, I'm not healed. What's the difference? Jesus said, whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas turned around and said, Lord, we don't know where you're going and we don't know the way. You see, he couldn't see it. He couldn't understand it, but he did know it was there. It was there. It was there. But he couldn't perceive it. God's healing is there. When you pray and believe, God's healing is manifest, but you can't perceive it if you're going by your five senses. You have to shut all of that off and operate in faith first. God's healing comes into your spirit first, into your spirit, and you can't feel it in your physical body at first. God's healing comes into your spirit. And then as you take these things that we're teaching on, and as you learn how to act on the Word of God, as you learn how to act on God's faith and release God's kind of faith, then that spiritual healing that has come into your spirit is released into your physical body, and your body will, will react. It will be healed. But until you believe that it's in your spirit first, until you believe that God has healed you, that God's healing is in you, that God did answer your prayer, until you believe that first, regardless of what your body feels like, the healing will never manifest itself into the physical. The person that's waiting until they see before they believe will never have their healing manifest. They won't have their answers to prayer. You've got to operate in God's kind of faith. It goes on to say in John chapter 14, Jesus said unto him, this is God's, Jesus' answer unto Thomas. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus said, you do two know the way, I'm the way. You see, Thomas knew Jesus, but he didn't recognize that Jesus was the way. You see, many of you know the Word of God, but you don't recognize that the Word of God is your answer. You're waiting on God to do something, and you don't recognize that God's already done it and given you the Word of God and the Word's your answer. All you've got to do is act on it, and you've got your answer right in your hand. Many of you are sick sometimes. Many of you are depressed, discouraged, lonely, defeated, dismayed, and everything else, and you're saying, why doesn't the Lord do something? He's done it. You got your Bible right under your arm, many of you, sitting right beside your bed, right in the room with you, and yet you're discouraged and defeated. God's already done it. His word's there. If you just take it and act on it, you've got it. God's already committed to you His power, His weapon, the Word of God. It's the thing that He created the worlds by. It's the thing that He's going to judge the worlds by. It's the thing He's going to destroy His enemies with is the sharp two-edged sword that comes out of His mouth. God's given it to you, but you don't see it, and you don't perceive it. And so because of it, there you sit, saying, Lord, I don't have it. God says you do have it. You say, I don't have it. He goes on to say in verse 7, If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. And so Jesus said, You have seen the Father, you know him, and you have seen him from henceforth. Now that's what Jesus said. Now Philip turns around this time and Philip says unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus just got through saying, From henceforth you know the Father and you have seen him past tense philip says no lord show us the father and it'll do that that'll be plenty you see he doubted and disbelieved jesus turned around and says have i been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me philip he that has seen me has seen the father and how sayest thou then show us the father you see again jesus was their answer but they didn't perceive it you know why because Jesus wasn't in a glorified body. He wasn't radiating light out of his body. He didn't have a crown on his head. He wasn't seated at the right hand of God the Father. He was in a physical body. And it says in Isaiah chapter 52 and 53 that there was no beauty in the body of Jesus. There was nothing special about his body. It was a common body like anybody else. He wasn't beautiful. He wasn't. He wasn't extraordinarily muscular, anything else. He was a physical, natural body just like anybody else. And they had a hard time perceiving that that was God. They had a hard time perceiving that what they were looking at was God. But you see, in the spirit, Jesus was God. In the flesh, Jesus was God. 
but they couldn't perceive it because it wasn't what their five senses had thought. It wasn't what their five senses were expecting. You see, they were operating in a sense knowledge. They're saying, well, I'm looking at you, but it's not what I see. Jesus was saying, I am the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Their five senses were saying, well, you don't look like the Father. They were obeying their five senses rather than the Word of God. Jesus was not in the form that they wanted him to be in, that they expected God to be in. Well, the same thing's happening now. The Word of God, this Word is God. God is His Word. Not the physical letters, not the things that you see with your eyes written on the page, but the Spirit that's behind these. And it says in John 6, 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are Spirit and they are life. The Spirit of this Word, it is God. It is God. But you see, many people don't perceive it. They're saying, oh, Lord, come in a vision and heal me. Come in a vision and touch me and speak to me. Oh, I want to hear the voice of God. I want to have a dream. I want to have a voice speak to me. And you see, what they aren't recognizing is that God has spoke to them. This word right here is God speaking to them in a booming voice, in the most powerful manifestation he ever made. Uh, from the beginning of time, is this Word of God. But they don't recognize it as that. They look at it as being a book. They may even say it's the Word of God, but they don't take it as being the Word of God. They don't love it. There's days that they go and don't even read it. And yet they say that they believe it's the Word of God. Boy, if you really believe this is a Word of God, then you're going to soak it up. You're going to get and find out what God's got to say to you. But you see, people haven't put that kind of emphasis on the Word of God. When it says in the Word of God that by His stripes we were healed, past tense, people take that and they say, well... You know, is that really right? They don't take it as being absolute. You have to put God's Word absolute. When God says you were healed, you were healed. I don't care if it doesn't look like you're healed or not. God's Word says it. And when you put that Word preeminent, then your body will match up. But first of all, you have to put the Word preeminent when your body isn't matching up. You have to believe that it's so when it doesn't look like it's so in order for it to be so. You have to put God's Word first place and say, I am healed, even though it doesn't look like it before it can come to pass. And so you see, don't make these same mistakes that these disciples made. The Lord says that you're healed. The Lord says that you're blessed. The Lord says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, that you have, past tense, been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Don't turn around and say, well, boy, it doesn't look like it. I don't know why I'm not blessed. You are blessed. It's just the fact that you haven't believed it first. When you believe it, even though it doesn't look like you're blessed, then you're going to find out that those blessings will come to pass. They will manifest. But first, you have to believe it. First, you must believe before you receive. Praise the Lord. So you believe that God has given you his faith, and then the application of it as you begin to use it, you, first of all, go by God's Word. That is the greatest form of faith, according to Matthew chapter 8. The highest form of faith is the faith that says, Lord, I don't need you to touch me. I don't need to see a vision. I don't have to have a dream. I don't have to have a flash of light. God's Word says, I believe it is so, and you stand. And having done all to stand. That's the highest form of faith. And to a person that believes like that, nothing will be impossible unto you.